Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Smart Indian Agriculture on the Federal.com. I am Vivian Fernandez. On the 13th of May, India banned the export of wheat despite asserting that 10 million tons would be exported this year against a little over 7 million tons last year. The ban came even as global supplies were choked by sanctions on Russian exports and those from Ukraine being held up because of the military conflict. Earlier, on the 28th of April, Indonesia banned export of palm oil in all forms, crude, refined and used, to quell domestic prices, which are doubled to more than two US dollars a litre. Are such bans compatible with free trade? Will they have a chilling effect and force countries to adopt inefficient import substitution strategies at the expense of consumer welfare? To discuss this, we have with us Dr. Ramesh Chand, uh, who is a member of Niti Aayog. Dr. Chand has more than 30 years of experience as a researcher, teacher, administrator, and policy advisor. Before joining Niti Aayog in 2015, he was director, National Institute of Agricultural Economics and Policy Research in New Delhi. Dr. Chand, welcome to this interview, and thanks for making the time. Welcome. Sir, in the heady days of economic liberalization, I remember M.S. Gill, who was uh, the agriculture secretary in the 1990s, telling me that food, sec food security was dollars in the treasury and not necessarily food grain in the granaries. But in crunch situations, we find that this philosophy does not hold. There were bans on export of agricultural produce in 2008 sparking food riots in some countries. And again, this year, we have seen bans, including by India. From a strategic point of view, do you think that it is unwise for countries like India to over-rely on global uh, food trade? I will come to the quote of uh, uh, Mr. Gill. I think during normal time, it is okay that uh, copper matters more than uh, availability of food. So you can buy food. You need not necessarily uh, uh, produce food to uh, achieve your food security. But during uh, time of uh, food shortages, it is not the money which matters. Then you find that situation totally changed. This was discussed during the food crisis of 2007 to 11. ASEAN invited me to deliver a lecture and Secretary General of ASEAN, ASEAN put this question to me that till now we thought we have deep pocket, we need not worry about producing food, we can buy whatever food uh, we want to buy. But then during the time of food scarcity, because food is such an essential commodity, you find that money may not uh, buy you require food. So policy of normal time and policy of abnormal time, these are two different kinds of stories. Uh, in case of uh, India, as you all know that uh, we are self-sufficient in most of the food, only in case of pulses, we depend uh, almost on regular basis on import to some extent, to the extent of uh, uh, 7 8%, which of course is now declining last five, six years. And in case of edible oil, our import dependence is more than 50%. So that is really a matter of concern and government is seized of it. And from time to time, uh, efforts were made to improve our self-sufficiency in food. And now, uh, last one year, government is working on uh, national uh, palm oil and oil seed mission. We want to increase uh, uh, domestic uh, production of uh, uh, oil seeds of all kinds, including uh, wherever palm oil cultivation is uh, possible. So government is aware of this and efforts are on to, to, to reduce our uh, uh, import dependence in case of uh, edible oil as well as pulses. Okay, so I'll come to um, palm oil and uh, pulses specifically in, in a bit. But are you suggesting that, see, these uh, uh, one-off events, like what we had this year, what we had in 2007-2008, these are uh, rare events which happen once in multiple years. But how do we prepare for those uh, eventualities? Because people have to survive. You can't just say, you know, that just hold on for uh, a few months um, until we are in supplies. So does it mean that countries with large populations like India necessarily have to adopt import substitution measures and encourage domestic production with high import duties uh, 
even though this might not might not maximize consumer welfare you see uh, this uh, last uh, uh, 14 years we are facing this crisis uh, second time and uh, my own uh, uh, feeling is that uh, this kind of uh, crisis will be further aggravated by forces like climate change and we may expect uh, future to be different than what by the past in case of food uh i do not uh, uh, suggest uh, that uh, that uh, we try to achieve 100% self sufficiency uh, in case of uh, product like uh, edible uh, oils there in the normal time we get uh, edible oil at a price 75% to 60% of what is the uh, cost at which it is available in domestic market so import is generally uh, uh, very very helpful in those uh, situation that uh, you get uh, import at a much lower rate than but uh, the price at which you will get uh, produce in the in the country but in case of edible oil our concern is that india with the population of 1.36 billion people if import dependence is more than 50% a small step by a country like indonesia that we will raise export duty on palm oil or we will stop uh, export of palm oil we should have uh, first of all long term we should improve self sufficiency right now we are working to bring it down uh, bring it the import dependence down from more than 50% to something like 30 to 35% so second is that uh, to deal with this kind of things some sort of uh, other options like uh, strategic reserves like we have buffer stock in case of cereals and that is why that it is because of these buffer stock india was able to sail through without any problem during 2007 to 11 when even some of the dwelled country they were in serious trouble uh, relating to availability of rice availability of wheat but we absolutely had no problem the situation was so comfortable again this time you know that how much problem is being faced by world but we have adequate availability of rice adequate availability of uh, of wheat after mm-hmm. this we tried this buffer stock thing in case of uh, pulses uh, i did a report that uh, whether and how much buffer stock of pulses should be there initially i suggested uh, 2 million ton then we increased it a uh, little bit so again the experience of last 4 uh, years is that with that buffer stock we are able to keep prices less unstable than in the absence of that uh, that uh, buffer stock so there is a way to calculate that if you want to insulate uh, your uh, market from sharp fluctuation in international market to the extent of uh, 60% 70% 90% uh, 100% insulating up to 100% turn out to be very very costly that should not be attempted but there is some level depending upon commodity below that like in case of uh, cereals uh, when i did that report for uh, buffer stock for ministry of food uh, i just calculated that india should maintain uh, insulating against global shock to the extent of 90% if you move to uh, 100% then the cost of uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, turns out to be much more then even import of costly food so this is how i think uh, we should uh, we should uh, uh, deal with the situation so buffer stocking uh, stocking norms insulators to the extent of 90% uh, meet our requirements up to 90% there are some policy influencers who have been saying that the food corporation of india you know holds more grain than is required that are you know food stocks are many times the buffer stocking norms now in the past two years we have found that because of these excess excess stocks we have been able to give food to the poor in uh, 2020 2021 for example we distributed 103 lakh tons more and in 2021 21 22 we distributed 119 lakh tons more is there a requirement now to revisit the buffer stocking norms in the light of the past two years experience the practice in the past has been that buffer stock norm are periodically uh, revised after 5 to 7 uh, years 
I think that uh, seven year period is going to be over. So there is definitely uh, uh, a requirement that uh, because population change, base of production change, uh, price behavior change. Uh, so those are the factors which uh, matter for uh, buffer stock. Uh, and let me tell you that buffer stock is not only maintained for meeting requirement of PDS. Buffer stock is also maintained for sake of price stability and as a strategic uh, as a strategic reserves and also you see we our food security has four pillars and procurement is one pillar msp is there so it is not only that we are maintaining buffer stock uh, for consumer we are also maintaining buffer stock that in order to honor minimum support price be why produce from the from the farmers so then how much uh, produce will come uh, uh, into the uh, warehouses of government uh, also depend upon the relationship between what is MSP and what is the open market price. So since, since 1718, we adopted new formula for MSP. So that turned our domestic prices higher than international prices. So because of that, if in 14-15, I think 13-14, we were exporting 5 million ton of wheat, that suddenly uh, came to uh, came to naught because our domestic prices, uh, MSP particularly, was higher than uh, but were the uh, uh, international prices. So if buffer stock are higher, it is not only that we are keeping access compared to what is requirement of PDS and strategic uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and food security reserve. It is also sometimes because to honor MSP, we have to procure and, and uh, that uh, may not necessarily be what we plan that 40 million ton or something like that, that can go uh, more than that. So that is the that is the reason. But I feel that uh, 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 procuring more than what is uh, required for buffer stock is okay as long as we are able to dispose it of uh, 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 either in the open market or in the international market. So problem is there, not that we procured it and buffer stock got uh, built up and buffer stock in fact got accumulated over time. So annual mismatch between what is needed for PDS and other welfare scheme and what is procured uh, can be addressed provided it is a complicated relationship. It is not simply that uh, mm. this is the norm for buffer stock and uh, this is what government is keeping. And also even here it is important uh, to mention since I did that report for buffer stock, the buffer stock notified by Ministry of Food are in fact lower than what was recommended by the technical uh, committee which they constituted and which I had it. So uh, by they were uh, uh, notified at uh, lower level because they then uh, constituted another uh, committee of three experts, I will not name them, to examine the uh, uh, recommendation on buffer stock uh, by the technical committee. And I presented before them their view at that time was that uh, since there is a Shanta Kumar committee report, government might uh, like to give some food in the form of cash rather than physical quantity. So therefore, we will need much lesser stock for PDS than what my report had uh, uh, estimated. But as we Very all fact, know, yeah. we are if going I can interrupt you. distribution. Cash kind of thing did not happen. So what you see as the, as the buffer stock, uh, minimum buffer stock, meant by food ministry is on a lower side. So regarding cash transfers also, in the light of experience in the last, last two years, do you think it's it would have been wise to give cash transfers, to give, you know, um, foods, I mean, uh, to give um, money to the poor to buy grain rather than supply food grain in kind? Because in the last two years, we saw that there were supply disruptions and even if people had money, they would not have perhaps been able to buy uh, food grain or buy it in the quantities required. I am personally a strong supporter of giving uh, physical quantity rather than giving uh, money and there are several uh, reasons for it. Uh, in many parts of the, our country, markets are still not working properly. So we may believe that let them buy through market, but in many parts of the country, distant uh, place, you will just find that uh, markets are not uh, working uh, as efficiently or competitively as we expect uh, them to uh, function. 
then uh, if you give money cash transfer there is no guarantee that a household will necessarily spend that money on buying food staples if cash is given in the hand of person then it will depend upon but is the marginal propensity to consume food and i did a paper i don't remember exact figure that uh, possibility is that average household will not spend in rural area more than 50% of cash on food that that is what uh, all uh, empirical studies are showing that out of uh, one in rupee incremental income half of it goes on food and rest half goes on non food uses so that mean if you are giving cash the possibility of a household buying food is half of what you are giving through pds which has implication uh, for uh, for nutrition thirdly if we do not procure food uh, for pds how we implement msp if we talk of cash uh, for pds we should also talk of giving uh, msp through cash so it is not that we can do one and uh, not uh, do this so then for the entire system we need to have a uh, different kind of thing that in case of uh, food grain beyond uh, some level we go for deficiency price payment don't actually produce the food and then we can do cash uh, kind of thing to some extent in the case of pds also so regarding msp you said that in the past few years our uh, domestic prices have been higher than international prices which is why we have not been able to dispose of the grain when there is an excess procurement does it mean that we now need to revise the way in which we calculate msp because currently it is all paid out expenses plus 50% should the msp also have a relationship with international prices uh you see the problem with international prices are that they are notorious for their uh, volatility like if we are fixing we were fixing msp in last four years based on uh, but the international price then uh, for this year msp per wheat should be something more than 3000 rupees so since international price is fluctuating in case of msp you expect a smooth somewhat predictable trend uh it will not be accepted by producer or by any stakeholder that in some year you increase the price given to them by 30% in next year you reduce it by 20% then by 10% that kind of thing so if we anchor our msp to international price then it will require that it in a year like this you increase price of wheat for example by 30% and after a year or so when wheat prices are uh, going to come down and they are definitely going to uh, come down uh, 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 reducing it by some percent that is not acceptable in our uh, country you can't do it you can increase price but you cannot reduce it that's mm-hmm. why government try to make msp particularly for procurement purposes relevant to open market price by giving bonus okay that you do not raise the base of msp but to meet the with the uh, uh, specific situation uh, you are paying to farmer uh, this uh, uh, this uh, bonus kind of thing so these are the things because of which i feel that uh, uh, exactly anchoring or aligning msp with the international price uh, uh, doesn't work in many cases so you talk, spoke about uh... Uh, achieving self sufficiency or uh, near self sufficiency or achieving some kind of comfort uh, in uh, cooking oil in oil seeds in the 1980s we had launched the technology mission on oil seeds and when uh, uh, rajiv gandhi was the prime minister and we also had something called operation dara no import duties at that time were as high as 85% but researchers said that only a third of the increased production was due to increased yields and more than half of the increased production was due to oil due to area extension including under 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 irrigated conditions so unless we have you know um, better technology do you think that only with the help of high import duties um, it is advisable to achieve uh, self sufficiency in um, oil seeds no <clears throat> you see technology is very very important technology create possibilities but policies help to harness those opportunities 
so there is a very strong synergy between uh, technology and uh, policy if we have one not another it will not work so i just uh, agree with you that if we just uh, say put uh, higher and higher duty and only try to increase price and uh, technological breakthrough doesn't happen gain is very very partial same thing happen when technological breakthrough is happening but support policies are not there gain is uh, very partial but in case of oil seed even one fact i would like to mention that uh, when we followed this uh, technology mission and we restricted import we got a very high growth rate in case of uh, edible oils in fact in some of the periods 15 20 years period the growth rate in oil seed was much much higher than what is the growth but why the growth rate in case of cereals but still you find that in the case of cereal even with such a low growth rate we emerged as surplus but in case of oil seed even with a much higher growth rate our deficit increased the reason behind this is very simple that is that is consumption diversification consumption behavior in case of india per capita intake of cereal in many year has either remained stagnant or increased very small in some year it has even declined but in case of edible oils uh, indian have started consuming so much of oily diet oily oily, uh, oily food that uh, that uh, i think between 2005 and 20 the per capita intake increased from something like 9 kg to more than 20 kg so that is the kind of per capita increase which made india so much uh, uh, import dependence on uh, edible oils yes we could not uh, make a technological breakthrough particularly in case of uh, soya bean their yield is stagnant for last uh, four decades that is one factor but another factor which uh, contributed to at least half of the uh, uh, import dependence is increase in per capita intake of uh, uh, oil seeds which we must record mm-hmm. so in the case of mustard there has been uh... Um, a technological breakthrough in the form of genetically modified technology you know the dara mustard hybrid 11 which a team of delhi university scientists led by dr deepak pentel they developed it and the gac has given its approval or is recommendation for commercial cultivation but the government has been sitting on it since 2017 now yeah. activists might dispute whether dara mustard hybrid actually gives a high yield but the point is that it's a very good uh, technology for hybridization of mustard which is a self pollinating plant so why don't we encourage such efforts when we require every technology in this country to increase the production of oil seeds no i do not uh, discount uh, yield of uh, dm hybrid uh, mustard i have said paper by i have seen paper by professor pentel really uh, i would say a very significant uh, uh, achievement is uh, there but in case of food you know that there are sensitivity for transgenic those sensitivities are there not only in india they are in almost throughout the world except some countries that uh, that uh, in north america they are uh, just uh, uh, going for it a country uh, uh, bigger than india china they did not go for transgenic in case of food and most of the in fact the number of country which has gone for transgenic in case of food is very few and the number of country which have not allowed transgenic in food is very very big compared to those which have uh, accepted so because uh, uh, it is a food and there are consumer uh, sensitivity around it so uh, taking uh, uh, into consideration the consumer uh, sensitivity uh, 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 i feel that uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, transgenic uh, mustard or gm mustard could not be uh, accepted uh, for release but now government has taken uh, i would say that uh, half day that uh, uh, that genetically edited uh, kind of uh, uh, technology you know there are two ways one is that you bring uh, gene from outside not only that species even from outside the kingdom like in case of bt it is not even from plant kingdom it is from bacteria it is from animal kingdom that you are bringing a gene 
which really is a genetic uh, manipulation and what he knows what will be the long term uh, but can be long term uh, consequences of that but in case of genetic genetically edited crop you are uh, playing with the uh, uh with the potential that is already available within the uh, species so therefore uh, the the dangers or risk or threat uh, associated with genetically edited uh, i would say uh, is uh, hardly any or very little compared to the other kind of technology so this uh, decision by government should encourage our scientists to make use of that in start of genetically modified uh, uh, kind of uh, technology and try that in case of uh, particularly oil seed dr chand this conversation with you has been very educating and illuminating for me and i am sure for the audience as well you have put uh, a range of issues in perspective thank you very much thank you